have um, we have uh, participants or facilitators from all over the world, but uh, we are today we are going back home. So I'm super happy to have Mathieu Lamol today um, with our presentation, complying with voluntary sustainability standards. Before I introduce Mathieu, uh, remember that um, this webinar will be recorded, so you will have access in the 10X uh, platform anytime. And at, at the end, as always, we, we will post the, the poll. So we invite you to provide feedback on, on this presentation and any other uh, comments that you have that always help us to improve um, how we arrive to you, how we get you uh, with the uh, knowledge and the skills that, uh, that we want to, to transfer to all of you. Again, uh, I know Matthew has a lot of uh, stuff to present today, so let me introduce him. Uh, Matthew uh, has over 15 years of experience in international trade, market access, and sustainable development issues. And he holds a master's degree in international economics and management from Solvay Brussels Schools of Economic and Management, and he speaks English, French, and Spanish. I, I prove that we've been having many, many missions in different languages, and he's amazing on that. Um, in the T4 Trade for Sustainable Development development team, that is where he works in ITC, uh, he leads the development of the standards map. That is a global repository of sustainability standards, code of conduct, and audit protocols. And he coordinates partnerships with private industry groups, companies and NGOs on the use of a standards map. You will see all the, the, the benefits of this standards uh, map that he will present today. Not only that, but all, all the topics in terms of complying with voluntary sustainability standards, how they will help you to improve your offer to international markets. And basically he delivers as well technical assistance and offer advisory services to develop sustainable sourcing uh, strategies, helping companies to integrate sustainability in their supply chains and meet international markets requirement. As you can see, Matthew is the guy to tell you what you have to do to, to move in the, in the sustainability world that is so needed uh, to, uh, nowadays. Matthew, million things again i know you are a super busy person and take the time to to present uh, today the the webinar and to share all your knowledge with these women owned businesses is a pleasure for us welcome and the floor is yours well, a big thank you uh, juan for the invitation um thank you uh, everyone for uh, watching the webinar and for joining the session uh, thanks also for the, the kind words, Juan. Uh, I hope I have the man. I am the man. Uh, at least I will be very happy to share uh, some of our thoughts at the ITC on sustainability standards and complying with them. It might be sometimes complicated. It is, uh, it is a kind of an adventure, a journey to go through. And um, indeed, I mean, as, as you mentioned in my um, bio or uh, presentation, I am also managing the standards map tool. And today is, is the day where I will show you how it works and how you could be uh, benefiting from this application. Um, I have prepared a number of uh, slides, uh, not too many because I don't wanna be too academic, but I wanna still go through a, a few points with you to uh, really expose why sustainability is so important. What does that really mean in the context of global value chains, globalization, and actually today in a, in a kind of a COVID recovery, although we are not yet recovering. I mean, there is a, there was hope and then there is not hope anymore. There is a wave, a second, a third, a fourth or fifth wave. So we never know when it's going to be really ending. But one thing which is sure is that uh, it has distorted the way we are working. Uh, COVID pandemic has distorted the way business is working and sustainability has a role to play. Uh, sustainability can bring resilience. We can come back to this concept in a moment. Uh, but I thought it was an important uh, topic as well to address. So this is my second point of the agenda. And of course, sustainability is a concept, but there are practical tools to really embrace uh, sustainability in the 
social side, environmental, climate change uh, from a, a company perspective. And I want to tell you how to comply with those standards. Um, sometimes it's an audit protocol or it's a product certification system that exists and that your companies can actually consider uh, to better position your products in international markets and get a nice deal with your, with your buyers. So this is the core. So complying with the sustainability standards and how does that work and for whom and then uh, what does it entail? And this is where I will be introducing you the, the tool, the standards map. Uh, standards map, which is an online application everyone can access on your smartphone, on your computer, on your tablet, on anything which is connected. Uh, and this is really a, a, a practical, easy to use uh, application to navigate the jungle. It's a bit like the GPS. It's the GPS on sustainability. That's an analogy that we that we like to use. So I'll show you how it works, um, and then uh, back to the back to the ground. So concretely, uh, what can we learn from the the experience of sustainability standards and the practices? Uh, what does that mean for a post-COVID um, more resilient type? Uh, business uh, context. I will end my conversation with you today with this kind of discussion about uh, lessons learned, conclusions, and next steps. Um, bearing in mind that today's webinar is, is, of course, a critical piece of the program, but next week there will be another uh, presentation uh, about sustainability tools and a, a kind of a live debate and discussion with you. And then there will be also, of course, all the recordings available on the platform uh, for you. So, uh, and one thing before I start uh, on the mega trends and you know what is at stake, I wanted to also remind you that there is a possibility for asking me questions unless you are watching the recorded version of the webinar. But if you are live <laughs> streaming and live watching, uh, there should be a chat box that you can use to post questions, which I will answer uh, towards the end of the session today. So um, the first topic I want to discuss is about megatrends. Megatrends in global value chains, uh, what happens, what it, it entails, and what really we can see. So global value chains, they have changed a lot. Uh, they have changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years. Um, basically, you have a consolidation of actors and traders, buyers that are, you know, using the international routes of the commerce, of the trade to access and, and uh, their suppliers and then to make uh, connections to the markets. And one thing, if you look at the first graph that was really clear, is that the sustainability concept of uh, international trade, so trade that also has an impact on social conditions and workers' rights and human rights, but also on climate change and environmental issues, biodiversity, deforestation, all these concerns have really emerged in the form of standards starting in the years 1980-1990s. At that time, if you wish, there was a realization that uh, we do not have two planets, we only have one. There is no plan B, there is no planet B, there is only the Earth, and we need to be, let's say, mindful of the limitations of uh, resources that are at our disposal. Um, environmental resources, the oil, uh, the also the, the the way we we live with the uh, you know good quality air and and climate, and then that the social issues. I mean, together with globalization and companies going abroad to get cheaper labor with you know countries that have let's say less strict regulations, that has really created um, very bad situation and you know, modern slavery, among others. And therefore, those considerations for sustainability were growing up. Uh, there were a, a number of international rounds and, converse, and, and conventions like the, the United Nations Rio Declaration on Environment and Development that was in 1992. And since then, really, global value chains have been more and more uh, encompassing the concept of sustainability with a rise in the number of initiatives that you can see very clearly on this first graph between the years 1990 and the years, let's say, 2010. 
So a big proliferation of sustainability initiatives. You have a government that has a new standard. You have a company that has a new standard. You have a, a civil society organization that has developed a certification program to ensure, let's say as an example, that the coffee produced in Brazil does not contribute to deforestation or that the cocoa that is produced in Ivory Coast does not, let's say, well, prohibits or refrains child labor, or that you have garment and textile factories uh, in uh, Bangladesh or in India that are also mindful of human rights considerations. So a lot of these initiatives have bloomed up and proliferated between the years 1990 and 2010. And right now we are reaching to a plateau, a kind of a where well, there, there are already so many initiatives, it's difficult to reinvent the wheel uh, more than a certain number of times. So that's the first consideration I want to have very clear in your minds that value chains have been more and more encompassing sustainability initiatives in the last 30 years. Now, the second graph that's on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen is looking at the market for certified products, uh, which means the market demand for products that have gone through a certain certification of uh, sustainability attributes. And we have looked at a number of sectors, banana, cocoa, coffee, cotton, oil, palm, uh, soybean, sugarcane, tea. And in all the sectors, you can see that um, the bloom of sustainability initiatives that you see on the other graph has had an impact that step by step, the products have been more and more certified and the demand has been growing. It's not, uh, it's not a slow growth, it's, it's a rapid growth. It's a very accelerating market trend that products that have been certified are more and more demanded. That means that the market is changing and the global value chains are changing. Which brings the question to you as entrepreneurs about, yes, but how do we comply with sustainability initiatives? How do we go with the flow? And is this a temporary situation or is it really something that is announcing something new for the future? And this is where I'm coming with a, another um, graph, another set of uh, information looking at uh, the retailer's perspective. And here is a snapshot about Europe. So at the ITC, we have made a survey of uh, hundreds of retailers in France, in Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Spain. And we have asked them about how they see sustainability. Is it important? Is it not so much important? Uh, where is it going? And is the market growing or not? And well, you already see the, 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 the picture here with a 92% average of all the retailers in those countries that have confirmed that they expect their sales of products um, in, that have sustainability standards to increase in the next five years, so up until 2025. And this is, this is big. This is, this is something you cannot neglect. You, you cannot, um, you know, like the ostrich, like put the head in the soil and not see anything. It is there. It is happening. So the retailers, they know for sure that the sales will increase, that the consumers, at least in those countries we have surveyed, but you can easily extrapolate to the rest of Europe, the consumers are more and more keen to buying products that have sustainability attributes. And by attributes, I mean a certificate, a kind of a, a confirmation that the product is not destroying the climate, that it is respecting human rights, things like that. The traceability and the transparency about the product origin is there to happen and the people want to know. So the sales are expected to grow. You can see that. Now the question would be maybe in some sectors more than others. And that is what the second graph is showing you. So we looked at you know, the broad range of sectors in which the retailers are you know, gathering those, those market demands and the trends from the consumers, everything from beverages to clothing, food, mobile phones, uh, furniture, printed materials, toys, and, and etc. And basically, it's, it's simple. I mean, in some sectors like electronics and toys, you have indeed a big, a big percentage that is growing in terms of sustainable sales. 
some sectors like the clothing, they were experiencing uh, between the, the years 2016, 2017, a kind of a decrease, but that's really the exception. Most of the sectors, it is a big growth. It's, it's a big growth to have products that are more sustainable, be it as beverages or food products, mobile phones, uh, et cetera. And, and the toys and the electronics is, is definitely something very key. So if you're buying products, if you're selling products, um, be aware that the, the, the market is changing and, and sometimes it is changing very radically. So that means that if you sell conventional product without any sustainability claim, without any sustainability, let's say certificate or something like this, uh, chances are that your days are counted and that in a matter of short time, uh, you will be irrelevant and other products competitors will take uh, your place. So that's, again, that's a very important lesson to, to know. And when you analyze the market dynamics, you, you can really see that this is something important coming up. Now, we also asked some of the uh, retailers, okay, now, when you look at it, when you look at the COVID situation, uh, what do you think uh, the situation will be in the future? Because sustainability is there. Yes, there is demand. Yes, consumers are interested. Yes. Uh, but in the COVID and post-COVID-19 pandemic, the question is, will sustainability still be there? Uh, now everyone is fighting for survivance. Uh, it's about making sure that the companies are not going bankrupt or being, you know, wiped off because of the pandemic. So is it still relevant? And across the board, companies are saying that no, sustainability is part of the future. It is part of the solution. It is part of the solution because it brings resilience, it brings solidity, it brings assurance that the company has a market to go. Uh, it is not the silver bullet. It's not because you have a sustainability standard or a certificate that automatically everyone will be so happy. And of course, you have a market and we will give you a big price. No. But uh, compared to those companies that do not have a sustainability standard or a certificate, um, you will be advantaged. Uh, so this is, this is part of the solution for the future. And it goes across food, coffee, furniture, clothing, where you see why companies are really sure and committed to doing more and more uh, sustainable business uh, practices. So that's, that's an important piece to, to really uh, bear in mind. Now, back to the key question, complying with, with sustainability standards. Uh, what does that mean? And first, maybe the question is, <laughs> what are the standards? You know, you, you may wonder, uh, based in Dubai, based in Cape Town in South Africa, based in uh, Colombia and Bogota, what is a sustainability standard if you are an exporter of certain products? Um, how, how do you deal with that? So here is a definition to start the conversation and just make sure that we are more or less at the same page. A sustainability standard, or we can also use the abbreviation VSS, but I don't like that abbreviation so much. Let's say sustainability standards. It's a set of rules. It's a set of rules uh, that uh, companies will have to follow. So it's a set of requirements that companies have to do, and then to prove that they have done the right thing. Uh, a set of requirements that address from a sustainable development perspective, social issues or environmental issues. Uh, social issues, I mentioned human rights, but that also is workers' rights, payment of wages on time. If you work like more, like overtime, is it also compensated? If you are sick, you have right to have sick leave, um, things like this. So this is all about social issues. And then on the environmental side, well, it's about making sure that your company does not pollute too much, that if you use water, you also treat uh, wastewater, uh, that there is also a consideration for biodiversity. If you work in agriculture, uh, if you also work in uh, sectors outside that there is no link to deforestation, or at least something which is in line with a, a number of indicators and requirements. So this is the standard. A sustainability standard is this global set of rules and requirements. And basically that set of rules 
is accompanied with a verification program. So you have, it's, it's like a document that is the standard. And then you have an auditor or someone that will check that you have done the right thing. Uh, and that basically the whole list of things that are important, well, you have done a good job. And this is the standard and the implementation and the verification of compliance. Okay, so this is what we are talking about. And it can be different forms of sustainability standards. Sometimes companies, they only have their own internal standard. It's, it's, a, it's a charter. It's a, let's say, it's a, a, a modus operandi for their business. And that is okay. That is a standard saying, okay, I will do this, that, this, that, this. And then there is verification behind so I can put it in my annual report. But sometimes the standards are very different and they are managed by an outside organization. And they say, look, hello, this is me. I am a certification body. I will come and check your company against all these points. Okay, so you have all sorts of animals. And this is where it becomes complicated because sustainability standards, it's a bit like a, a big jungle, okay? It's a jungle that you need to navigate. There are standards that are only for certain sectors or product categories. And then there are standards that are applying across a wide range of sectors, okay? So if I give you an example, a chocolate factory uh, will use standards for cocoa, but you may have also a standard that is an overarching social environmental standard applicable to not only chocolate, but also garment and maybe jewelry, okay? And those standards, they, they are different. I mean, you do, not, you do not get certified or verified in the same way. So a jungle because of all this variety of instruments, standards, certification systems, protocols, guidelines, reporting. So it is complicated. And, and the goal of ITC and, and my team at ITC is really to bring, to bring some transparency so that you know which are the standards that are maybe most relevant for you. Uh, if you would like to be, uh, if you're interested in uh, sustainability uh, standards. So what we have done, and this is the, the, the right hand box on the screen, it's about, we have built a unique database that is very big. Uh, it, is, it is more than 1,500 data points per standard. So 1,500 data points where you can see what they ask, how much does it cost? How long does it take? And what does it bring as a benefit? You know, and which market does it address? Uh, which consumers are interested by this standard? So this is the big, big, big database that we have built. Now, uh, very important in the database, because there are so many different standards, uh, we need it to keep neutral in the sense of, yes, we are an agency of the United Nations and we cannot say one standard is better than the other one. So usually we have, every time we make a presentation like today, uh, we have questions in the chat box or in the audience that says, hey, can you just tell me which is the best standard for my business? And unfortunately, I cannot tell you. It is not that I can tell you nothing. I can tell you which options you have. But it really depends on your strategic objectives to decide which is the best standard. So we remain neutral in terms of uh, decision of which standard to use. But your company, your business will know best which is the good solution using our tool. We bring transparency and we bring information about all of these uh, standards so that you can access it as a free global public tool and that everyone can use companies, but also policy makers, trade promotion organizations, business uh, support organizations, civil society organizations, everyone can use the, the, the standards map. And this is very much trying to, you know, reveal what is behind the seal, what is behind the logo. Maybe just looking at what is currently on the screen, you say, aha, I remember one or the other. Rainforest Alliance, does it ring the bell or fair trade or fair for life or union for ethical bio trade or global gap maybe? Um, we have 300 of these standards in the database, 300 of them that are there 
um, it might be a little bit scary or confusing having 300, but we will tell you what is the detail about each of them. So this is where standards map come, comes into the, into the picture. And this is the, the, the website, the, the standards map website um, that I was telling you in the very big intro and, and Juan as well, that we have built for your, for your attention. So bearing in mind that the market is growing and that the number of standards is so big that it is a bit confusing, it is complicated as well to choose or to understand which is the one for you. Well, we have built this database and this website to navigate uh, the database. So it's a global public good in a sense, you don't have to pay anything. It is there for you to use for free. We have uh, generous donors that are kindly supporting the maintenance of the database. So this is great. And this is thanks to them that we can offer you all the data updated and uh, ready to be used um, for free. Um, it's covering a multitude of sectors, like a bit more than 80 sectors. We have currently users, when we look at the web traffic from more than 190 countries, and this is great, and the numbers are growing every time. So I'm hoping that after today's webinar, the, grow, the numbers will e even grow uh, a bit more, right? So that you can also take a look and become a big fan of uh, the standards map. Um, this, is, this is basically where I will leave it here. So I will stop sharing this, uh, this picture, this screen, and I will now share another screen, which is just the, the standards map website itself. So I'm going now here, there we go. So you would be now seeing uh, standards map. The PowerPoint presentation said it's www.standardsmap.org. So you will remember it very quickly. I mean, standardsmap.org is the website. And this is the homepage. So on the homepage, well, it's just the explanation, as I mentioned before, about who we are, and what we are doing, and why is it so important. The quick thing to access the, the, the platform and to start reviewing it is to click on this button that says explore uh, the standards map. And here, we wanted to make it as easy to use as possible with a simple um, selection menu. So you see we have uh, now over 300 standards and they are just listed here in alphabetical order. Okay, so we have everything from A, B, C, D, E up until Z. And, and the standards are listed there, but it's a, it's a big pocket, right? It is the jungle. This is, this is an introduction to the jungle of, of standards. Now, to refine the search, well, simply use one of the filters. So for instance, you can select a big sector like agriculture or electronics or things like this. Let's say electronics, you select it and automatically you see now the list is updated. We now only show 41 standards over the 303 that we had in the database. Um, we could also select a product that is more precise by just typing the letters. So for instance, I'm typing coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E, -E, and there we go, product. And so here I have not a big sector like agriculture or electronics, but only coffee. And you see in this sector, wow, we have 87 uh, standards, but at least, you know, it, it reduces the possibilities and there you, you make sure that you have something a little bit more uh, relevant. The filters, the more you put in there, the less the number of standards you will see in the in the database. So for instance, by origin, you would say, okay, I'm interested in uh, coffee that is coming from, in this case, let's say Brazil. So you type Brazil, and then you have the country, you select it, and the number is going down. I mean, same thing if I had selected garment uh, and Bangladesh, you know, the, the origin. So you see the standards that really do operate in Brazil in coffee, so in the country of origin and for the sector that you have selected. Um, being more precise, maybe the destination, if you say my company is traditionally exporting to China or to Canada or maybe to France, well, you just type it here. And so you can see which is the standard that is uh, demanded in the country of destination. So let's say here, Switzerland, because I live here and I like my coffee strong. So Brazil is a good producer. So I select, and that's a fun, I mean, that's just my, my opinion. It doesn't reflect what ITC would say, maybe. Anyway, my coffee, 
coming from Brazil, going to Switzerland, and sustainability standards associated with it, uh, I have here a number of initiatives that could be interesting to review. Uh, now, if you know already the name of the standard, like Fair Trade or Rainforest Alliance, you just type the name here and it will appear. Okay, so you have different ways of, of selecting the, the, the different boxes. Um, very quickly, there is an advanced search. Um, it's only for you if you're interested in looking at specific areas like uh, standards that deal with biodiversity or standards that deal with uh, gender issues, you see here you have a number of, um, let's say, additional categories, and the more you select them, the more you will reduce the list of standards that are uh, in, your, in your basket. Uh, so this is the advanced search. It is interesting, but for the sake of the presentation, I will just focus on a simple scenario. Coffee exported from Brazil into Switzerland. I have a number of standards. Now, how do I understand which is the good standard for me. Uh, this is where you would see a first little text explaining what is the standard. So we can select maybe for C, there is, uh, why not here, BioSwiss, because I'm in Switzerland, maybe I would like to have an organic standard. So you see, you can select them by clicking in the little arrow behind. Um, there is fair trade uh, and global gap. So maybe I can select those two standards as well. So you see, just because from the list that I have generated, I would like to know more about some of them. So I select them in the box by just clicking here in the little arrow. As soon as I click on a standard, it is selected in a basket that comes at the bottom of the screen. So you see here we have BioSwiss, we have Global Gap, the Fair Trade USA, and then uh, 4C. So we have four selected standards. And obviously the list is much longer, but when we review them, uh, because it's a lot of information, my recommendation to you is to have at the maximum four standards at the time that you would select. Right, so, so not, not five or six, but try to stick to four. You have selected them, and now you have the option to start reviewing a short summary of each of the standards or to make comparisons and understand how they operate. I will start with the summary and then only make a comparison. So the summary here, you see uh, the page reflects the 4C standard. If I click on fair trade, it refreshes the page and I have fair trade data. If I click on global gap, there is global gap coming. If I click on BioSwiss, I have BioSwiss coming. And the information that comes into the summary is about what the standard does. So some facts and figures. Very important, it is the requirements tab. So you see here, I have clicked on requirements and this is where I can see this set of rules that I have to comply in order to be BioSwiss certified. You know, so compliance with sustainability standards, it comes with the requirements. What do I have to do? So here, by clicking on requirements, you see that BioSwiss has a lot of environmental requirements, a little bit on social, a little bit less on management and quality and then ethics. And those requirements, they can be immediate within a year, three years, five years recommendations. And this is where you will see more or less the spread of the, of the requirements. Just to give you an example, I click fair trade. And in fair trade, I also go to the requirements. And here you see the picture is different. What you have to do to comply with the fair trade USA standard is a lot on social, quite a lot as well on environment management and then a little bit on quality and some ethics okay so you see you can you can see what the standard really requires in order to comply with the standard you need to do a lot on social environment etc and then you will ask me yes but what is it what is it that i have to do and this is actually below so just below the graph you have all the the requirements that are listed into categories the categories are environment, social management, quality, and ethics. Every category, you can click and open it and see what you have to do. So environmental, in the environmental category, you have soil, forestry, inputs, biodiversity. Every category has a subcategory where you see the 
question that you have to do on, in this case, soil and soil erosion, conservation, quality. You see, you click on the criteria soil conservation, and now you can read. This is what you need to do in order to comply with the fair trade certification. You have quite a number of requirements, okay? So if you go back to the big picture, you have 76 criteria in environmental issues, 99 criteria on social, 32 on management, two criteria on quality, 11 on ethics. What are they? Click on it. Anti-corruption and bribery. What do you need to do? Ethics. And here you go. You just read. This is what fair trade will ask you to do in order to get the certificate. So complying with fair trade will go through all of these requirements that you have here. Now, do you remember I said, okay, you have the spread between the categories, but you also have standards that have immediate requirements or things that are within five years or even recommendations. So not everything needs to be complied. Okay, you do not to, need to comply with everything in one go. Sometimes you have five years or three years or actually even one year. And this is where you will see when you open the categories that there are those criteria, even before opening it, you see this one is an immediate, this one is a within five years, and this one is, yeah, well, within five years and immediate are the major ones. So treatment of waste of chemical substances, you have five years to comply with this requirement. So just a quick recap. I selected coffee, Brazil, and Switzerland. I selected five, no, four standards that are interesting to me. And then when you click on them, one after the other, or global gap, you look at the requirements and you can see what you have to do. So you see here, global gap is again very different. You have a lot on environment, a lot on quality, but very little on social and very little on management. Now, this is when you look at the standards one after another. Okay, you, you have the standards one after another. But I mentioned to you in the menu, you also have the comparison side by side. So when you can compare them, you start putting the standards in the same graphic. So here you see BioSwiss. This is the first one with a very heavy focus on environment and then social. Global Gap, you see here again, same thing, big focus on environment little one on, on, I mean, second one, big one on quality, fair trade, biggest focus is on social issues, and then the 4C. And the same way as we had before, you can actually go back down and start looking at the information side by side. So now you can see if your company is interested in one of the four standards, um, what is it that is required by the standards on any of these criteria, well, all the data is there. All the data is there for you to compare and to see, okay, if you have, if you have one certificate to choose, which one would it be? The one that has the least criterion or the one that has the most? Well, it very much depends on the target destination and the buyer requirement. So if your buyer says, in this case, a coffee trader, based in Switzerland, says, I need fair trade US, at least you know what you need to do. You know what you need to do, and you can start making analysis of your business, saying, are you really doing the right things when you look at the criterions of the, of the standards? And this is, this is the purpose of the, of the standards map, to help you uh, compare the standards and go back to the um, uh, to the analysis of the market potential for your exports. So um, quick recap before, before I go back to my, to my slides and uh, the conclusions, I think a main lesson here to learn from the standards map website is that you can easily explore which from the jungle of standards apply to your sector of activity to the country in which you operate. And also if you're interested specifically for the destination market that you're addressing. So you can go and select 
multiple combinations of countries by origin, by destination, the sectors, or if you already know that your counterpart, business counterpart would like to have a certain standard being complied with, type the name of the standard and you will see it ha happen in the list. And then you can analyze all of their requirements. And this is, this is critical because you see the, the, the key question is that sometimes you have, you have to comply with the market requirements, but you do not know exactly what to do. So here, if the buyer says, I would like to have an organic uh, certification, well, you will be able to select, for instance, the one that they want, and then straight go to the summary, learn more about what is it, like the EU organic farming standard, what is it, how do you do this? Um, and then you get to the requirements and the requirements will tell you in a very simple list, how many things do you need to do? And yes, it takes a little bit of time to go through the list, but this is the only way to comply with the standard is really to understand what is it that you need to do that the European Union partner will check with an auditor or with a laboratory experiment and testing of your product. So just be aware, read about those texts, it's sometimes complicated to just look in the internet about EU organic farming. We have consolidated everything here for you in only one application. Um, the standard operates with different types of audit mechanisms. And this is also something that you can easily review directly online in the, in the, in the standards map. So this is for the application. I am sure that my colleague next week will also touch upon it very quickly because this is a key element of the sustainability tool that ITC has developed. But I would like to take the, the next few minutes to go back to my presentation and share with you some thoughts about what does that really entail for, um, for, the, um, for the presentation. So here I am now sharing again my screen with the presentation. And uh, I put it in full window. So there are, there are questions now in terms of uh, the value chains, the market demand, and the positioning of the products. And uh, we, we reflected in a group uh, at ITC discussing with the stakeholders about how does the, the, the future look like uh, post-COVID and in a way uh, addressing the concerns and the needs for uh, more sustainable products and certified products that are definitely coming up in the consumers reports and in the different market trends. And here is what we have summarized vis-a-vis -vis, uh, retailers, policymakers, suppliers, in terms of what they think uh, the future would be. So when we speak with the EU policymakers, there is certainly a big wish from the European Union to engage in uh, you know, some sorts of incentives for the uh, sustainable imports so that the policy regulations in the European market are more convenient, more, let's say, friendly and open for sustainable products. That means market access conditions would be uh, preferable for sustainable products than for products that do not have so much of a, um, uh, a traceability and uh, origin of the product uh, system. That is one thing. A second is to really engage at the, at the policy level between the governments and the European Commission so that those governments in other countries outside of the EU that do speak with the European Union, that they can engage into a dialogue to foster and to reinforce um, the sustainability components of their trade policies. That means helping companies to get certified, helping companies to comply with international standards on labor rights and social issues, and also making sure that there is more, um, more prominent uh, role for the environment in the, in the trade policies. So this is also what the EU policymakers certainly uh, would say. Uh, creating the enabling environment, this is, this is what I reflected from the statistics I showed you earlier on those retailers in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, 
that really have a strong appetite for sustainable products. Well, why? Because in the European Union, there is this enabling environment where companies that are doing the right things, they have more, let's say, incentives, benefits, they get more visibility, they have a better reputation, and this is really helping the movement as well. So the, the business environment is really helping a lot. And this is a reflection also for policymakers outside of the EU that by enabling companies to be more sustainable friendly or more, let's say, oriented for sustainable practices, that really has a, 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 a potential for high repercussion on the domestic market. And then finally, it's about educating consumers. Educating consumers that have an appetite for products that are ethical, that come with good values and you know, social environmental considerations, this is, this is certainly there. So that's on the policy side. Now on the retailer side or the big brands and the big traders, um, we, we saw the big trend of integrating sustainability into their procurement practices. So when you buy, when you buy a food product, you don't only buy the food. You also, see, you also look at how the food was processed, how the food was produced, how the, the pineapple, the orange, the rice, the, 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 the meat that you're eating is produced. And that there are some considerations for all of these processes to go through it. We don't want to only feed the people. We want to give them good quality food and food that respects multiple other attributes. So the retailers, they know that. They know that the consumers want it and they need to sometimes go a little bit beyond the traditional way of producing their products so that they are compliant with the standards and they can communicate about it. They can communicate about how their products is positioned compared to the competitors and that they are actually following uh, good practices. Now, the industry in itself, um, they compete, you know, I mean, the companies, they are competing between themselves. Uh, that is a matter of fact, but there are certain things where they do not need to compete. There are certain areas where they better work together rather than compete. Yes, you can compete saying, my beverage is better than yours and Mr. or Mrs. Consumer, please buy my product and not the competitor because it is better quality. On sustainability issues, it is better to work with your competitor so that you have more impact on the way this is produced. So I give you one example. A company in China that is working with their suppliers, with their different network of business partners. So they all align on a certain set, set of standards, set of requirements saying, we all together will do the same vis-a-vis -vis pollution, water, and biodiversity. So we speak with one common language. That means when the external buyer from United States or Europe comes, they have access to a wide range of companies that are already aligned with a certain set of sustainability practices. So this is about developing pre-competitive frameworks where companies can work together and achieve more in sustainability than if they were working alone. And this has a good press for international buyers because they know there is potential there for their suppliers to all work together and the, 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 the amount of products that will be on the market will be good enough. So that's, that's also an interesting trend. Some companies, some retailers, they say they would like also to work more closely with NGOs and civil society organizations. Now, this does not happen in all the sectors. Uh, this is something that, for instance, in uh, if you take fisheries, you know, wild fisheries, so capturing fish in the, in the ocean or in the sea, um, it is something where working with NGOs is co sometimes complicated because there is a lot of criticism about the biodiversity, the overfishing, etc. But in other sectors uh, where the um, regulations are more strict and where you know, companies are applying uh, rules a little bit more uh, systematically, then working with NGOs can really help going the extra mile and not just criticize the companies for everything they should do better, uh, like it is often the case in the fisheries, although some examples also show that companies are doing good things, but nevertheless, that has happened. And so NGOs can also help companies so that, you know, 
it's not just the private sector and the NGOs, but rather a kind of a mix of, of good intentions and the consumers as well that have a role to play with the, with the retailers. And the last is for the suppliers. So everyone who's trying to export their products, I think many of you are in this situation. It's about being more aware of the market demand for the sustainability standards and being more aware on how to comply, how to comply with the standards. And for that, really use the standards map, read the requirements, try to see if your company is already in a good state for complying with the requirements that are requested in the destination market using one or the other standard. Engage with the buyers, discuss with them, listen to the consumers and the customers and see which is the standard that you can best you know, use in order to bring your product and say, hey, you know what? My product is not just a product. It is the product. It is the product that is sustainable and that really you know, flies very nicely into the flow of the demand for, um, for new products. So with this, um, I know that we have a lot to cover. I'd love to answer a few questions. I'm sure, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you would have some questions. I will maybe just turn it back to you, Juan, for a few words yes. about next week and the, the course. And then if you have questions or if you've seen questions, let me know. I'm happy to take a few before the end of the hour. No, absolutely. We have uh, already some questions, very interesting questions. Uh, let me let me just talk about next week later after the questions and in the in the wrap up. Um, if you don't mind, I can start with the questions, Matteo. But first of all, wow, I love it. I mean, this is uh, I'm really passionate for sustainability issues, you know, and and just to highlight that uh, remember everybody that the, the main topic of Dubai, um, she tries Dubai is sustainability. And then you are bringing today to the participants such a powerful tool. Actually, um, I can tell you some of the, the comments on the chat is like amazing tool, amazing information. So, so it's so good uh, that I'm very happy uh, for it. So let me, I have, uh, three or four questions for some of them are very specific, but let, let me start with the first one from Ashwini uh, Sathnur. I hope I, I pronounce it well. Uh, could I create research article contributions and publications for the objective of submitting to the standard map tool? So yes, uh, anything that would be added to standards map a new standard, a new piece, piece of research. I mean, our team is happy to work on it and to add new references in the, in the standards map. And then if you have specific needs for additional resources or publications or information on how to comply with that standard, again, we have a help desk and a team that will be happy to answer your queries. Uh, the standards map is continuously updated with new standards, new pieces of information. So also on your side, if you realize that there are some standards that would be add, nice to add, we can, we can do that. It always takes some time because we work with all the standards organizations to validate all their information in the database before it goes live. But uh, there is, I mean, only the sky is the limit. So ask us for new things and we will do our best and, and add them. And if you have specific queries as well, write us an email. Perfect, thank you, Matthew. Uh, now uh, from Saraswati Adipali, um, actually we are into trading and we uh, get sustainable product manufacturer and we sell it to the world market uh, on our brand name. As we are traders, do we also need to take certification or, the, or is the manufacturer certification sufficient? It's a good question. Uh, thank you for asking it. There are standards at every stage of the value chain. So you have standards at the primary production, at the processing and the manufacturing, at the trading side, at the retailing side. You also have even standards at the consumer side. The thing is, most of the standards that we have in the database, they are at the primary production and manufacturing side. So as a trader, you will probably be best placed in ensuring that all the products that you are trading 
are coming from one or the other certificate so that you have a certificate, a, a sustainable trading uh, operation. But you can also review at the level of the trading part what sustainability requirements and standards exist. And here, just to be, to be very clear, if you take a standard at the primary production, it will, for instance, say you need to harvest the cotton in a certain way so that it is good for the environment. At the manufacturing side, another standard will say you need to use the cotton in this way. You need to pay the workers and to manufacture so that you have a piece of garment at the end, which is sustainable. So you see, it's not the same standard. The first one is about how to grow the cotton. The second is about how to process and manufacture the piece of garment. And the traders, they will have another standard saying, okay, you need to respect the suppliers. You need to respect the, the terms of the agreements and the contracts, and you need to make sure you do that in an ethical way and that there is transparency, there is no fraud, there is no corruption. So you see, it's a different level, but this is a standard that will be for the traders. And then the retailers, they will have another set of standards. And hopefully when you put all the pieces together, you have a chain. You have a chain of sustainability at the production, at the processing, at the manufacturing, at the trading, and at the retailing. So there is, there is sustainability everywhere, but sometimes the, only the coffee is certified when it is grown or the cotton, and then there are some pieces missing along the chain. So as a trader, you need to see which is the part of the value chain that you need to make sure you have good sustainability impact. And we at ITC, we don't say that we need to have sustainability absolutely everywhere that is certified. Maybe some sectors need certification mostly at the primary production and other sectors, it's mostly at the manufacturing side. And in the end, if you communicate nicely and clearly, okay, I am trading sustainable products because primary production is sustainable, then you're clear, you're set, you're honest. Uh, if you say, well, the processing and the manufacturing has been certified, then again, you're clear. Perfect. Thank you, Matthew. We have a very specific question that is uh, somebody uh, is Yvonne Maniki that she was probably playing while you were uh, uh, presenting the, the tool. She was already playing with the tool. And then when I click by destination from the website, there is no Dubai. Probably, uh, yeah. There, there, there should be there should be Dubai. There should be Dubai uh, in the in the destination uh, boxes. Uh, United Arab Emirates and all the region is there. It is all mapped in the in the database. So um, I, I, I may just recheck uh, very quickly uh, as well, but it should be there. So no worries. And uh, again, there is the help desk. If there is anything not clear or not wor working right, or you type something and it does not appear, let us know. It happens sometimes that we have server issues, but very rarely. So I would say try it again. And otherwise, um, contact us and we'll be solving the issues and getting back to you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, oh, almost the last question and then another one, and then we, we are ready to wrap up. Uh, from Elizabeth Francis, are these standards recognized globally? Um, I, I'm not sure what is meant by being organized globally. Let's say you have most of the time. Uh, recognized, recognized, I'm sorry. Uh, recognized. Recognize, yeah, recognized globally. Uh, no, they are not recognized everywhere in the same level. So this is why you have standards that are mostly recognized in Europe or France or Switzerland or in China or in Canada. But I would not use the word, um, the word globally. Uh, but certainly they are recognized in some contexts. And this is where the tool helps you to understand where they are recognized. By using a country of origin and a country of destination, it shows you where which standard is being used and applied. That means where you can have access to certification facilities and, and you can have an auditor that comes and verifies. And sometimes where in the destination country, there is demand for the market. But I would say 
there is no one standard that is really globally recognized, except maybe for the ISO standards that are very much, you know, globally applied with the ISO national standardization bodies and also the ILO conventions, the ILO labor standards, the conventions for no child labor, no discrimination at work, uh, no harassment, uh, you know, all these big ILO conventions, they are social standards, so to speak, and they are globally recognized. But again, not all the countries have ratified them. So I would say always check from a business perspective where you operate and where you would like to export your product. And that will be the scope of recognition you need. Uh, if, if you have a potential new market, then check on that potential new market and you will see maybe there are some uh, other standards that could be interested also for you. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, the last question is from me, from Juan Hoyos in Geneva. Um, if um, a company, a small company, an SME, identify already with the standards map, the, the gaps, I mean, they, they identify, what is your recommendation to start closing those gaps where they can ask for help? Well, they can start asking for help already here at ITC. There are some capacity building programs where we help companies to close the gaps and to improve themselves. Now, those programs and capacity building we do not have in all the countries, and we usually need donor funding to help the companies. So either ITC can do it because we already have a program, or we can also direct you with uh, specialized organizations that operate in your country where such services of support can be um, offered. And then last but not least, we can also forge new projects and help you directly uh, uh, in, in terms of you know, finding the appropriate resources. Sometimes the standards organizations themselves offer such a service of closing the gaps. So most of the time it is, it is you have to pay for that, but sometimes they have also uh, online free resources and tutorials and uh, videos to help. But always start with looking if ITC can help. In most cases, we would be delighted to do, do, to do so. And if, if not, uh, well, we can always refer you to other institutions that are in charge. Perfect. Uh, there is one last, last one, because I saw the last minute, and then I, I, I want to, to ask you anyway, before we close, I mean, before I move to the logistics announcements, and then give you back to you the floor to close the webinar. Um, the, somebody is asking, uh, well, um, Gabriel Nowak uh, is interested in hearing more uh, on sustainability of tourism, more services than products. Any, any saying on this? Any thoughts? Can, can you just say it again, please? Yeah, I mean, they are interested in hearing more yeah. on sustainability of tourism. Tourism. Well, the, the tourism side is one of those sectors where sustainability has been really growing fast in the last five years, maybe even 10 years, but five years uh, really fast. In terms of recognition of hotels, tour operators, and different types of services that are uh, very much linked to the tourism sector. So in that sense, you can also select the sector tourism in the standards map and see the standards that already exist that we have already referenced. There are already a, a number of such standards that are available for review. And then the new standards in tourism, we are trying to keep abreast of those new initiatives so that we can also use them in the, in the standards map and reference them. Uh, there, there is also the GTSC, Global Tourism Sustainability Coalition. So remember that GSTC. And this is a, a, a chapeau organization that is about sustainable tourism. They have uh, events online and in person, and they also try to harmonize a little bit the concept of sustainability in the tourism sector. So what does that mean for a hotel, uh, a chain of hotels to be sustainable? Um, and, and this is very interesting, but as I said, this is, this is mostly recent trend that standards are proliferating in that sector. So um, yeah, happy to, happy to share some papers and resources about it, but already please, uh, for those interested, take a look at the GSTC, uh, Google it and find the organization. They have very interesting resources. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. 
Now, let me let me move to uh, the last announcement. Um, there is a question. Uh, remember, so let's start with this one. Next week, um, instead of um, preparing another panel as we've been doing the previous months, we decide along with Matthew that it would be great to present the sustainability map. That is not only the standards map, but the sustainability map where you can, you can find more information from uh, another amazing colleague that is is Greg Samson, uh, and then Greg will will present as well other features of the maps uh, and tools that uh, Matthew's uh, section uh, have been developing for years, and it's so they are so so uh, they are really amazing and so needed uh, at this time. Um, remember that uh, on the right side of your screen, next to the video wall, when you have you have the chat box, you have the polls. Uh, please, uh, we invite you to to answer the polls. Um, so I remember that as well. That after the the webinar, the webinar, yeah, the webinar of the presentation that Greg will do next week on the 23rd of August, we have we offer you the role of standards in sustainable supply chain, an online course of two weeks, full of information, very useful as well. Then it will bring you more elements to, to fine tune your understanding of your needs in terms of the sustainability offer. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, again to, to have all of you here. And of course, Matthew presenting these amazing tools and knowledge on sustainability. Uh, and Matthew, I give you uh, back the floor to you to wrap up the, the webinar. Again, million thanks. It's really it's so helpful for all the participants. That is, is, is really, um, um, we are very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everyone, again. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, nothing much more to say except a uh, good continuation in, in your work. ITC is here to help you. Uh, standards map is at your disposal. If you have any question, please contact the team. There is a, a contact us button in the website that you can use at any time. And uh, yes, looking forward to hearing back from you and working uh, if uh, working together on some projects and probably also meeting in person in Dubai, if possible. I would love to do that. So a big thank you to everyone and uh, all the very best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. I forget to say, I forgot, sorry, but next week we will, at the end of the panel, the webinar, we will present all the new, all, all the announcements on the changes, uh, change of dates for Dubai physically in, 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 that was not going to happen in October. It's going to be at the beginning of next year, but next week we will uh, inform all the data, all the dates uh, officially uh, to all of you. Thank you very much and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.